we like to talk so much. We like to smell like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, look, look at the things the world goes to, the things the world goes to, and try to see how close we can get to sin without sinning. Lord, help us to be sanctified and move our spiritual vehicle closer to the center line of not legalism, but of holiness and sanctification. Lord, help me and light, guide me and show me, for I need the Lord more and more every day. Psalms 127, verses 3 through 5 says, Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like the heirs in the hands of the warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Our students are going to children's church. Um, as the children are, are leaving, if you were not here last week, someone contacted me and said, I've saw these, uh, I got a bag of these little Jesuses, Jesuses, L little Jesus statues. Can I put them all over the church? I said, you bought them? They said, yeah. I said, knock yourself out. So if you're here, we're not here last week and you see little Jesus t um, statues everywhere, you're welcome to take one home. But the point was they wanted us to be reminded that Jesus is always watching. Um, if you want to take one home or put it in your uh, car, put it in your pocket, whatever, you're, you're welcome to take them. So if you're wondering what they're all doing here, that's the purpose of them. <clears throat> um, and you're welcome to come grab mine after service if you want it, whatever. There's a few. Uh, that if you want to stand on Mary Martin's shoulders, you can get that one right there. I'm sorry, Mary Martin, I'm picking on you. Okay. Um, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do. If I have your Bibles, and I hope you do, we're still in the book of Philippians chapter 2. It's where we kind of stopped last week. We were talking, we've been talking about cussing Christian and what the Bible says about cussing in our own, in our words, because our words have power. What you fill your mouth with is what you are speaking into situations and circumstances. And cuss words are called cuss words for a reason. And there are things that it might not be wrong for you to, there are things that might not be wrong for you to say, but you shouldn't say them. And when we were together last, we were talking about Philippians. In Philippians 2, 14 through 15, that's where we stopped, where Paul was in an awful situation and was saying, do things without grumbling or complaining or disputing. I can't go through the day without complaining. It's very rarely I can get out the house without complaining. Honestly, I'm complaining because I got to get up. And it doesn't matter what time I go to bed, it's always too early when I have to get up. Now, do I get up because I'm an adult? Everybody say yes, but I don't have to like it. But the Bible says do off, and even when I'm not complaining, I'm grumbling. Yeah, some of y'all have never had that problem. Do all things. You know what the word all means? It means all. Lord, help me. And help us do all things without grumbling or complaining so you will prove why. God never asked you to do something without there being a good reason. Do you remember, you remember growing up when you'd ask your parents, why do we have to do that? And they said, because I said so. Right? Or how long before we get there? How, how much longer? You'll find out when we get there. Don't ask me again. Y'all remember back in them days when we didn't have technology, you used to watch your favorite raindrop race down the side of the window because you were so bored and you were sitting there. And y'all know what I'm talking about. You got that triangle window to get a little bit of, of air. Do all things so you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent. Children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. If you're not paying attention, we live in a very crooked and perverse generation. And the enemy, listen to me now, the enemy can use your Christianity and manipulate you to be a righteousness that stinks in the nostrils of God because you're religious and you turn people off who need, just need to see a light. They don't need you to judge them. You can preach without ever talking. This is where we start, Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We need to understand that worship for the Christian is not just singing and tithing and raising your hands, but worship is an every single day offering for God to use you all day, every day at church and at work. So quit saying, well, 
you don't know the people I work with, I have to cuss. No, you don't. I know they may make you want to cuss, but you don't have to cuss. You don't have to be ugly and rude just because everybody else is ugly and rude. You don't have to grumble and complain just because everybody else is grumbling and complaining. You remember what Mama said, just because everybody else jumps off a bridge? Are you going to jump off a bridge? Worship is not just Sunday mornings when you feel like it. Worship is a 24-7. I was just talking to someone this week. I reminded them that for the Christian, your allegiance is not first to the U.S. government. You're not an American first. You're a Christian first. That you are a Christian before you're a man or a woman. You're a Christian before you are Democrat or Republican or Independent. You're a Christian before you're anything else. Worship is not just those things. It's in every single day, every day at home, at church, at work, everywhere. So I ask my, how many of you know, if you don't want to know the answers to some questions, you don't ask certain people. Because they will tell you and believe Jesus can heal you and they're not going to, they're not going to powder it up. They're not. So I ask my children, am I the same at church as I am at home? And they said, yeah, you're pretty ornery at home as much as you are at church. So it's okay, good. At least I'm not here. You know, I don't want them to say, well, Papa's just sunshine and lollipops at church, and then he's mean at home. They, they nicely told me, no, you mean everywhere. So I'm, I'm working on that. Lord, help me work on that, right? Because I need to personify a spirit of worship like we all need to. Paul, while he was in a pretty bad place when he wrote this, he chose to worship God. Paul could do that because with Paul, listen to this, Paul could choose to worship God no matter what circumstance he was in because Paul was not the center of Paul's life. We have a we problem. We say what John the Baptist says, may he increase and may we decrease. But we don't live it. What is it that we want? I Paul is telling us, I'm not a real prisoner here. The real prisoner are those poor guards that are chained to him in 10 to 12-hour shifts. And I get to tell them about Jesus Christ every day, twice a new guard. And how many of you have ever pulled, I mean, you've ever pulled duty, you've had a, ever had a job you didn't want to do, but you were required to do it? I know, now this is not in the Bible. I can imagine the guard saying, come on, dude, you got to switch with me. I can't stand to talk to this dude again. He talks me to death for 12 hours about this dude named Jesus. How many of y'all been in job situations like that? Like, I'll give you, an, I'll buy you a Snicker bar if you'll just switch duty with me. I'll, you, you understand what I mean? I, Tell me what your favorite, I'll buy lunch for you. Just don't make me be chained to this dude for 12 hours. Paul was saying, I'm not a prisoner. The people that are chained to me are prisoners because I'm telling them about Jesus. And watch this. Most of the, most of the men that were chained to Paul were part of a sect, S-E-C-T, of the Roman guard called the Praetorian Guard. Okay? Why does that make a difference? Because the Praetorian Guard were, were the majority of the guards, the Roman guards that were sent to a little place many of you have heard of called the British Isles to settle it. And a lot of them had been converted to Jesus, to Christianity. And if you're white and you're from the British Isles, it's probably because some of those guards had a lot to do with it. So they were chained to him. It was not the way Paul planned to preach, but those men chained to Paul were some of the most important in the empire. And I have good news for you this morning. You need to ask yourself, what are you chained to? Or what is chained to you? What are you chained to? Or what is chained to you? Because that's a diff there's a big difference in that. Or what has locked you up or what is locked up with you in it? What are you chained to? The good news for you this morning is God is still in control. God still has a plan and a purpose. And God still has an assignment in your life. It might, your assignment might not be what you want it to be. But God nevertheless has an assignment on your life, and God can use what Satan meant for bad for his good and his glory. Paul was chained to a Roman guard in terrible times, but the truth of the matter is we are often all chained to something. Don't say, don't say your spouse is or your marriage is a disaster 
or a job situation or sickness and disease is the worst thing that's happening. Perhaps you're just chained to financial problems and the list goes on and on and on. What are you chained to or what is chained to you? As Christians, what are you going to do about it? There are some things you cannot do anything about. There are some things you just cannot do anything about. But there are some things you can do about some things. And what are you doing about those things? Are you going to complain about it? Or are you going to pray about it? Who said yeah? Okay. All right. Okay, I understand. At least somebody told the truth. Will you complain about it? Or are you going to pray about it? Okay, good. <laughs> He's working through his sanctification, it sounds like. Are you complaining or are you praying? If you can do something about it, why are you not doing something about it? If you can't do anything about it, have you considered another perspective about it? Because you change your circumstances by changing your mind, and you change your mind by changing your words. Instead of complaining, try speaking the word of God over situations. So you say things like, thank you, Lord, for giving me the job you want me to have. Thank you, Lord, for me being the best spouse my spouse can have. Thank you, Lord, for me being the best Christian I'm supposed to be at the church I'm supposed to be plugged in. So for your example, thank you, Lord, for leading me to what you want me to do to be the best Christian I can be at Goshen. You change your circumstances by changing your mind, and you change your mind by changing your words. And instead of complaining, try speaking the word of God over situations and circumstances. Lord, the doctors say there is no further thing they can do, but by your stripes I am healed. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name, that the doctors say, I can't take anything else for this situation. But, Father, you are the great physician. You, start, you talk to yourself anyway. Why don't you start speaking the word of God instead of speaking negatively to yourself? You already are, know you're crazy. Go ahead and start talking and speaking the word of God. If you are a Christian, Jesus the Christ should be seen through you first. Psalms 103, David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with love and kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So, this is how you work past complaining and criticizing is instead of you have a choice to fill your mouth with complaining or you have a choice to fill your mouth with praising of God. You have a choice of filling your mouth with positive things. You have a choice of filling your mouth with negative things. And both of those things, complaining and criticizing, are important parts in the kingdom of God. So we're talking about what our, the Bible says about cuss words and our words that come out of our mouth. And the second, the next one we're going to talk about, we're transitioning from there, is into lying. And if you're here and you think you don't have trouble with lying, you have trouble lying. How do I know that? Because I know human nature. Most studies have shown that people lie about four times per day. The University of Massachusetts said about 60% of people cannot meet a new person and have a 10-minute conversation without at least telling one lie. And you may be thinking, Ken, I don't lie, but do you embellish? That's a lie. Do you tell little white lies? That's a lie. Let's talk about what, before, before we talk about what I think about lying, let's talk about what God says about lying. Revelation 21 and 8. Here's one of the verses I don't like. Because look here in the list of all these terrible things. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderer, the whoremonger, the sorcerer, the idolater, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, let me say, and please hear, if you don't hear anything else I say, hear this very clearly. This does not, the Bible does not give you permission to be mean when you tell the truth. There are people who are just mean. And they say, 
well, I'm not supposed to lie, so I just told it like it was. Well, you can be nice about it. You don't have to be, well, God's given me a prophetic, prophetic gifting. Well, now, I'm not saying God has not made you a prophet, but I'm just saying you ain't got to be mean about it. You can tell the truth and not be mean. You understand? So please don't say, well, Ken said, it. I'm not going to lie, but I'm not going to, but I'm going to be mean. <laughs> you don't say I'm going to be mean, but you're mean. You can tell the truth and not be mean. Now, it's also helpful to understand different, different parts of our country look at how we talk differently. Okay? So I was only in Chicago, so boot camp, and then I was in school. I was in there about four or five months, and I called home, and in the middle of a conversation, Jeremy, my mama said, you're talking like them. I said, what does that mean? She said, them up north, them northern people, you're starting to talk like them. I was like, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, they understand me now, though. <laughs> you don't have to be mean. But the Bible does speak a lot about liars. Proverbs 12 and 22. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tells the truth. When you look up that word detest, it comes from the Hebrew word tohiba, which means something disgusting. It means something abhorrent or an abomination or to make someone nauseous. So when we lie, it is tied to a phrase that says it makes God sick. He hates it and he detests lying lips. Now, is anyone here perfect? That was mighty weak. So the next time you're caught or you figure out you've done something wrong, everybody does stuff wrong. The wise thing to do is to say, I did that. I should not have done that. And you repent to the Lord and you repent to the person you hurt or affected them. Paul says to the Christians in the church at Ephesus, this is the New Living Commentary. Okay, New Living Commentary, Ephesians 4 and 20. So this is not the exact scripture, but it's the commentary of it. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. 21. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on a new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. So it's been a long going thing. This was happening in the church in Ephesus. The pastor, the the apostle who started the church in Ephesus wrote a letter back to them and said, please stop lying in church. Please stop lying. Let us tell our neighbors the truth for we are all part of the same body. 26. And don't sin. He goes on to say in 26, and don't let sin, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down on while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Paul says, don't, he, he says, stop lying and don't let sin control you by anger. Don't let the sun go down on you while you are still angry. Now, this verse is used a lot, and I, I have a confession. I, I fail at this. Okay, I fail at, at 26 and 27 because when Miss Winnie and I have a knockdown, drag out, serious conversation, I want to apologize and get it over with, and Winnie needs a couple days to cool off with me. And I can't stay up three days until she's ready to talk. So I have gone to bed mad. And it ain't good sleep, but it's better than no sleep. So I confess that I am not good at this because my wife needs time to cool off and I mean, I, I think she, she, she's okay with me most of the time, but some, like in these situations, she's not real happy with me. I know that's a huge shock to some of y'all. But the Bible says anger gives a foothold to the devil. It gives him the ability to crawl in. And there are some, raise your hand if you're ready. There are some people who are, nursing anger 
that they should have let go of because what happened to them hurt them so bad they can control this anger and it feels good to have some control about the situation. So they say they've forgiven the situation, but they're still very angry about it. Now, mind you, I don't know what happened to you. So I'm not saying you're in the wrong for being angry. But I am saying anger, the Bible says anger gives the enemy a way to crawl in and don't let the sun go down on you while you're angry. Paul was telling Christians to stop telling lies, and we've learned many times that Satan is the father of what? Satan is the father of lies. It's been said that we are the most like Satan when we are lying. Jesus said that himself in John 8, to a group of religious leaders who were trying to find a way to kill Jesus and shut him up. In John 8 and 44, he said, you are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks it from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Maybe this is another one of the reasons why God hates lying so much, because Satan is the father of it. Satan's job is to lie, deceive, kill, steal, and destroy. And Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, which is completely opposite of what Satan is. The devil is a liar and seeks to use lies to fool us out of the freedom we have in Jesus Christ as Christians. Matter of fact, I want to talk about some of the ways, not all the ways, some of the ways Satan uses the trick of lying to influence us to lie. Here's some of the ways Satan influences us to lie. Satan wants you to get you to lie to others. Satan wants you to get to lie to yourself. And Satan wants you to live a lie. I probably should have made number two, number three for the last one, the most important one. But we're going to talk about Satan wants to get you to lie to others. Satan wants to get you to lie to yourself. And Satan wants you to live a lie. The first one, he wants you to lie to others. It can be something as simple as I mentioned earlier, exaggerating a story to make yourself look better. Have you ever noticed most of us, not all of us, most of us are the heroes of our stories. Rarely does anybody say, and I did this, and I did that, and they said this, and I said that, and then I realized I was wrong. So I said to them, I totally misunderstood you. I am so sorry I was wrong. No, we embellish that thing, and we say things like, and he puffed up his chest at me, and I puff right back at him because I'm grown. You know, just, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. If you've if you ever been with somebody who plays golf or goes fishing, you know what I'm talking about. That fish gets bigger every time the story is told, right? And if you hold a fish at just the right angle with your phone, it'll look like it's a great big old thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The joke is you should take a G.I. Joe with you fishing and put him beside your fish to make him look bigger. Or golf. I, you find out what kind of integrity a man or a woman has, you play golf with them. If you don't know nothing about golf, come talk to me. I'll tell you a story. We embellish. It could be something that simple, or it could be cheating on a test. It could be how much you really paid for something. It could be where you are, where you really were. No, Mama, I was at my friend's house. How many of y'all have learned, well, all of y'all here are old enough to, let me say it over here. If your mama asks you a question, she knows the answer to it. Mamas don't be asking questions they don't be knowing the answers to. Come here. You've been out smoking again? No, ma'am. And you smell like Marlboro Reds all over. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, ma'am. I ain't been smoking. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Have you been sneaking out at night? No, ma'am. Well, then why is your Converse print under the window sill? Right, y'all? Uh-huh. Yeah. Why is my bush broke? Right? Mama be asking questions. Mama be knowing the answers to Maybe it's, no, ma'am, I was where I was supposed to be. Well, with Life 360, does every parent here know about Life 360? Let me give a free advertisement of Life 360. There's an app you can download called Life 360, and you make the children's phone that you pay for, put it on their phone, and as long as they have their phone with them, it tells you where that phone is. And it's my favorite price, it's free. 
Now, you can pay for other services, but the location services, so and you can figure out where they have been. Ken, doesn't that, you're violating your children's freedoms. You don't have any freedom at my house. It's not a dictatorship, but it is a kintatorship. You do what I say, or you get punished, and then you do what I say. This is not a republic. When you grow up and pay your own bills and you're living, then we can be friends. But I'm not your friend. I'm your dad. Can I be friendly to you? Yes. Am I your buddy? No, I'm not your buddy. You can get lots of buddies. I'm not your buddy. All right, let me get off of Life 360. Anyway. No, ma'am, I was where I was supposed to be. It may be even telling what some people call a partial truth or a white lie. Or better yet, it's telling the truth as something you said in your head and not out of your mouth. How many of y'all have ever had, had arguments later in the shower and you're like, yeah, I should have said that. That's what I should have said. And then when you tell the story again, you tell it like you said it, but you said it in the shower. That's a lie. Quit lying. It's amazing how the sin nature of humanity is already geared towards lying. And you have to push against that. You have to push against it. You have to work to not lie. Lying is so easy. And even when we can't lie, we want to justify. If you take notes, you ought to write that down. When we can't lie, we want to justify. Do you know why I pulled you over? No, no, sir. No, ma'am. You know why they pulled you over. Tell the truth and shame the devil. Um, Craig Rochelle, a pastor, he said, now, do not do this. He said, this does not work. Do not do this. He said, but I got caught speeding. I was just speeding. He said, and I go to court, and I'm sitting in the court. He said, and everybody who, the judge, the people call the names, you go up, and you're only supposed to declare guilty or not guilty. That's what you're supposed to, that's the first step. Everybody does that first. He said, and everybody before me was not guilty. He said, they called me up, Craig Show. He said, he come up and said, I'm guilty. And he said, the judge went. He hadn't looked up the whole day. And the judge said, what did you say, son? He said, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. The judge said. Would you believe out of all this courtroom of people, this man is the only one who did anything wrong? He said, son, all your charges are dismissed. You're free to go. Now, Craig Rochelle said, don't do that. Don't speed and think the judge is going to do that. He said, um, but that was his lesson in lying because we're all told to play dumb. Some of us don't play, but we're all told to play dumb, right? You know why you got pulled over. It's amazing how we're geared toward lying. I wish I could tell you I never do this, but I'm sure there are times when I unintentionally, without thinking about it, just not tell the truth. And we have to be careful because when we do that, we need to recognize as Christians that lying is a sin and listed in the book of Revelation as those who partake in the lake of fire. So it's not something that's cute. It's not something that can be swept under the rug. It is a sin. And we need to be sanctified from that mess. When we lie, we speak the devil's native language and give him a foothold, a, a way to crawl in our lives. And we all know once you tell a little white lie, it's easier and easier to tell more lies. My granddad, we didn't go to church. Well, my grandparents didn't go to church. My, my, my grandfather, anyway, Bud. Even my granddaddy Bud would say things like, Son, just tell the truth. He said, you, if you start lying, you ain't going to be able to believe, remember all the lies you tell. He said, but if you tell the truth, you never had to remember anything. Even those who don't even have a Christocentric view understand to get through life as a, as a, a responsible adult, they didn't go to church, was if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember a lie. And how many of y'all know when you start lying, you're going to tell something that's a little different every time, and eventually that thing's going to get away from you? Right? So if you just tell the truth, I did it, I shouldn't have done it, I'm sorry. And don't say, I'm sorry, but. You just say, I lied. I, I should not have lied, or I embellished, or I shouldn't have told that. Just quit lying. Look at your neighbor and say, quit lying. Quit lying to other people. The second thing the enemy wants you to do is not only lie to other people, but he wants you to lie to yourself.
Now, I don't know if these people are really real, but number one and number two to me are best seen on shows like American Idol. Somebody did not love somebody enough to tell them, oh, honey, I know you like singing, but you can't sing. Right? Because those people apply to number two. They are offended because they know they can sing. Honey, you might enjoy singing, but you and I can't sing. But you know, I say it in Spanish, no, you cannot sing. Nobody loved you enough to say, okay, before you go on TV, I need to tell you something. We were just trying to help your self-esteem as a child, but you can't sing. Don't go on that stage. But what do they do? They go in there, and they think they're going to be the American Idol. And they can't sing. Satan wants you to not only lie to others, he wants you to lie to yourself. The biggest liar that we deal with is ourself. We can justify the pants off of anything. The hoops that people will jump through to lie to themselves goes beyond comprehension to me and in my mind sometimes. But I know I'm guilty of it as, as that as well. Because if he can get you comfortable to become a liar and get comfortable with it, then you get comfortable not only lying to others but lying to yourself. You start to rationalize and excuse lies in your life. Then you start to tell other lies to cover up the lies that you told yourself. And before you know it, you have a spider web and you're in the middle of it and you start to excuse your own sinfulness. Do not think God will wink and nudge and say you're different from everybody else because you have made up lies in your mind. The amount of stuff that I hear and I have even said to myself, things like, how about this? You ever heard a Christian say, well, it's not that big a deal for me. When I was in Boy Scouts, Adrian, when I was in Boy Scouts, I used to love to play with fire. I know it's a big shock to you probably. Um, one of the reasons I became an eagle is because I got to play with fire the whole time. Um, but how many of y'all know I learned a very valuable lesson along that path? Do y'all know where I'm going with this? You play with fire enough. Whoo. So when you say, lie to yourself and say, it's not that big a deal to me like it is to other people. How do you, what do you base that on? You're basing that on a lie to yourself. Or you say things like, yeah, I'm addicted to porn, but at least I don't beat my wife. How was that better? How was it? Yeah, I may be a drunk, but at least I'm not addicted to porn. Quit lying to yourself that one sin is better than the other sin. It's all, it, sin is sin. Except, now, Paul does make a differentiation for sexual sin. Sexual sin is the only sin we're told to flee from, but every other sin, God will provide a way. So, so there is a, a slight difference there. But quit lying to yourself and saying, at least I'm not that bad. Or, whoo, everybody's guilty of this one. I can quit at any time. And you're thinking, thank God I'm not addicted to anything like that. Then give up uh, Diet Mountain Dew for a week. Give up your cup of coffee. Give up your mocha choco laka for a week. And you'll see what you can give up and what you can't give up. Quit looking at TikTok. Quit looking at social media for a week and find out what you can and can't give up. And how easily that is. I'm not hurting anyone else, so it's no one's business what I have to do to get away with this. Some famous poet, I don't remember his name, said, no man is an island. No man stands alone. What does that mean? That means even when you do it, whatever sin you're involved in, even if it's private, you think it's hurting no one else, at least the person that sold it to you knows, or the person that participated with you in it or got it to you knows, quit lying to yourself. When we start lying to each other, it gets easier and easier even to lie to ourselves. There are so many biblical examples, but I'm going to point one out, and that's King David. Now, King David is a huge uh, study in the significance of being, well, the Bible, sa the Bible says that King David was a man after God's own heart. How many of us has God ever said that about us? was a man after God's own heart. But later on, look how he lied and then lied to himself in 2 Samuel. We're going to go there in just a minute. In 2 Samuel 11, the Bible says 
that during the time of the year where all kings were supposed to go out to war, David said, y'all got it. Just go do it. Which speaks to being too slack in your responsibilities as well. And David stayed home. And as being in the palace, one of the highest built, the highest building in the city, he's walking around his rooftop and then sees a beautiful woman taking a bath on a nearby roof. He told his servant to go send for her. She was brought to the king, and he forced himself on her and committed adultery. And instead of repenting, he started down a slippery. Have you ever slipped down? Did you do it on purpose? Most of the time, you don't do it on purpose. He started down a path when he thought his adventure was over till she sends back word to him, I'm pregnant. And the Bible says, I don't have the exact scripture in verse, but it says, your sins will find you out. The Bible also says, some men's sins go before them, which my understanding is, Sometimes your sin is exposed not to embarrass you, but to give you a chance to repent before you die and can't repent. But his little adventure and his little fling turned into all of a sudden now, Bath, her name was Bathsheba. Bathsheba's pregnant, and her husband is really high up the food chain in his army that's away at war. What am I going to do now? And instead of King David making it right, he starts to lie. He decides to bring her husband back for home from the war and say, you're doing such a great job. I want you to spend a couple nights at home. And he, him being a better, his name was Uriah. Uriah was such a man of integrity, he did not spend the night in his house. I'm going to go ahead and tell you all, if I'm at war and the king brings me back, I'm sleeping in my bed. Okay? I don't have that kind of integrity. He did. Uriah slept on his front his front porch and said, if my men are sleeping in the field, I'm not going to sleep in my bed. So that kind of messed up King David's, well, if he comes home and then he comes home in a while and she's had a baby, it must have happened while I was home. That's what he's, that's what he's thinking. So he's, he's weaving this web. He's weaving this story. Now all of a sudden he finds out for two nights he gets him drunk as a skunk. You go home and read this. This is in your Bible. David gets Uriah drunk as a skunk and says, now go home. You can go back tomorrow. He sleeps on the front porch again. So then David calls in his top commanders and says, it sure would be a shame if Uriah was on the very front line next week and something happened to him. So then he could say, Uriah was killed in battle, and I married this other woman and put her in my harem. And since they probably were not keeping up with gestation and L and D, if she had a baby, it would just be another baby in the palace. But instead of going to Uriah and saying, I did something wrong, I'm sorry, he begins to weave this thing and has Uriah killed. So he is a murderer, but not a murderer the way oh, he thought he was going to be a murderer. But Uriah still died. That way the king did not directly kill him. But if he happened to die, that would make his life a whole lot easier. Now that's the scenario, that's the scenario we're in right now. Uriah's dead. I can bring Bathsheba into my house and marry her, and she'll be one of my many wives, and no one will ever know. But you know who knew? God knew. And God sent you. Yeah, I admire Nathan. He was the prophet that was alive during that time. The prophet Nathan sent word that I have a story to tell the king if the king will entertain my audience, if he'll let me in. And the prophet Nathan was called, and God gave him this story. He went to see King David, and Nathan said, King, once upon a time there was a very rich and powerful man who had more wealth and herds and animals than you can imagine. And his neighbor was a very poor man who only had one little lamb. 
and his children loved this lamb, and it was like a pet to this man. And one day, a hungry man came to the rich man's house, and instead of killing one of his own animals to feed the hungry man, he went and took the poor man's lamb, killed it, and fed it to the hungry man. While Nathan is telling this story, King David is getting furious. And King David said, such a thing is so horrible. Who is this man? He should be put to death for this crime. And Nathan was able to point at the king and say, that man is you. And God has told me what you've done. Satan wants you to be fooled to not only lie to to lie, but also lie to yourself. He also, also wants you to be so fooled that you live a lie, to claim one thing and be something totally and entirely different. You, I, you, if, I, if I stood up here next week and said, I'm a professional bodybuilder, most of you could see that's not true, right? Even if I did that, you, you could tell, right? But if I started, if, if every time you saw me, I had a GNC bag or I had a great big uh, box of something from Amazon that was protein shakes and muscle building stuff, I'm living a lie, right? I'm living a lie. I'm spending a lot of money and living a lie. Satan wants you to not only lie to others and lie to yourself, but he wants you to be so fooled you live a lie. It can be something as simple as you are Mr. Christian to everyone who knows you, but you start drinking on the weekends and you slap your family around. It can be simple as you're Mr. Family Man or Mrs. Family Woman, but you have a roaring porn addiction that no one in your house wants to talk about, but everybody knows is there. You may have the perfect life on social media, but on the inside you struggle with depression and feeling of inadequacy and adequacies, and you are secretly cutting yourself for some kind of relief. Let me tell you something. I need to remind you of people on so Raise your hand if you're ready again. People on social media don't post pictures and videos of their worst days or when they're throwing up or when they first get up and they got no makeup on. They're going to post the, the, the best parts. Now, sometimes they do post tragedies to let others know about news going on. But I'm, what I'm saying is quit basing your life on this perfect life you think everybody has because everybody's messed up and everybody's crazy. It's just willing to what level of crazy you're willing to live with. Right? Because the real person you marry is home locked up in a cage. And after the honeymoon wears off, you find out what kind of crazy you've gotten yourself into. And that's why we cry when the bride walks down the aisles. We're not crying because she's beautiful. It's because she don't know what she's getting into. You might be Mrs. Pinterest mom to everyone else, but you're secretly a wreck and can't sleep because you're up performing for others. One of the biggest lies Satan has led humanity to believe is that there are many who believe the lie that they are Christians. I am, okay. I am, ter I'm, I'm praying about what to preach about next after I finish cussing Christians. I think I'm going to preach on the theme. I heard Pastor Craig Rochelle preach about it, and I'm going to use his artwork and the, the, the idea of what he calls the Christian atheist. The Christian atheist. Now, now you're sitting there thinking, Ken, there's no such thing. Exactly. But the amount of people who think just because they were born in America, they are Christians and going to heaven is not what the Bible teaches. As a matter of fact, I'm terrified that I'm not even a biblical Christian. Ken, why would you say that? Because how much of the stuff that in the red that Jesus said, am I doing? The amount of people who think they're Christians, to me, that may be one of the biggest lies that they believe that. They believe because I occasionally attend church and I believe in God and I sing the songs, I must be a Christian. For if I'm not a Muslim or Buddhist, then by default, I must be a Christian. Then let us examine the fruits of your life. For when you really examine your own relationship with God compared to what the Bible teaches, if you're honest, you might not like what you see. I think 
subconsciously. This is one of the many reasons Christians don't like reading their Bibles is because they don't like to be confronted with the mirror of what they're not doing. And we're worried more about people's opinions on social media or our friends' and neighbors' opinions than we are about our own salvation, and none of us is going to, be able, is going to get there that day and say, but Sister Sam Bucket was a terrible example for me, and I was the best Christian I thought I could be, and the Master has one or two things to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. There is no excuse. Are you living a lie? Are you a Christian, but you're not even a Christian? The Apostle John, who was the only one of the 13 to die of old age, said in 1 John 2 and 4, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If there's no biblical obedience in your life, just stop and think about that. If there's no biblical obedience in your life, if there's no change in your life, if there's no spiritual fruit in your life, yes, we are saved by grace, and grace leads, however, to spiritual works. When we say we are Christians but have no idea how Jesus would act, are we lying to ourselves? I say yes. If there's no biblical obedience in your life, what does that mean, Ken? Read your Bible. And find out what Jesus tells you to do. Show up for church and or, and or listen to Christocentric messages. Did you know there's free sermons every day on the radio? And some of them you should listen to and some of them you shouldn't. And you can come see me and I'll tell you which ones I listen to. If there's no biblical obedience in your life, if there's no change in your life, if you got saved and you're still the same, the math ain't mathin'. If there's no spiritual fruit in your life, are you lying to yourself? So before I close, I want to review just a few points, okay? Who is the devil? He's the father of lies. What is his native tongue? Lying. His greatest tool is getting us to lie to others, lie to ourselves, and live a lie. And he is a deceiver. We believe truth has been personified through Jesus the Christ, who said in John 8 and 32, So Jesus was saying to the Jews who believed in him, If you continue in my word and you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Lies bring bondage and slavery, but truth brings freedom. Satan wants you to lie to others, lie to yourself, and live a lie. Jesus wants you to walk in truth, experience truth, and truth will set you free. When you are confronted, stop lying. When you have an opportunity to make something right, do it. Ken, I don't want to. That's uncomfortable. Exactly. But you will begin to build a reputation of when others hear things or you say things and say, I know he, if that's wrong, he's going to make, make it right. She's going to make it right. You would not believe, and most of you now would probably believe, the amount of things that Winnie would come up to me and say, did you say this or do this? And I go, yeah, yeah, I did. I shouldn't have done that. I, 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 I can't believe I did that. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Not but. I was wrong. Here's your question. Here's what I want you to reflect on. If you take pictures of the screen, I want you to take on this one, and I want you to reflect on this this week, and we'll pick up with lying, excuse me, cussing Christians and what the Bible says about our cussing and our words next week. If there's no biblical obedience in your life, if there's no change in your life, if there's no spiritual fruit in your life, are you lying to yourself? Do you walk the walk and talk the talk? Or do you walk it when you want to walk it and not when you don't? Do you have any obedience in your life that is biblical? Do you say S-T-U-P-I-D things like, well, I know what the Bible says, but. No, 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 no buts. No buts. Are you obedient? Is there a change? And is there fruit? Because if there's not, you need to talk to the Lord. I'm not telling you to, you're wrong. I'm telling you, you need to talk to God. So stand to your feet, and let's bow our heads right now. Every head bowed and every eye closed.
Open your mouth and pray that direction with me. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who sin against me, Lord. Father, if there's no biblical obedience in my life, Holy Spirit, I pray, God, you challenge me to, to change my life and to line up with the obedience that you've called me to. Lord, if there's never been a change in my life, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, you lead me to change, Father. If there's no spiritual fruit in my life, forgive me, Lord, for being lazy. Forgive me, God, for being selfish and not doing anything as a Christian in, with, or around and for my church and in my community forgive me god if i have no spiritual fruit lord forgive me if i am lying to myself and father if i am lying to myself lead me father to repentance thank you god for helping me today if there's someone here who doesn't know christ and you'd like to receive him before you go i'd love to meet you up here at the front before we go is there anybody here today and then lord i pray you've given me the right words to say and how to say them that you've given me grace and mercy and say it the way you want it said. Thank you, Father, for bringing us here and bringing us back in the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. Shake hands with two or three.